Thank you very much, Marcel, and the organizers for this invitation to give this talk today. I'm very much looking forward. And indeed, um, I was asked if I could talk a bit about um, the past and the future of the crisis. I decided, since it's a very broad theme, I'll put some focus on um, aspects on molecular epidemiology, and that's in fact actually what my group does research on while we were involved, obviously, in the um, pandemic response more generally through the task force. And I will focus on how this aspect, molecular epidemiology, um, played um, a role in the science policy interface slash if it didn't play a role, where it could or should in the future potentially play a role. Let me start um, with a timeline of the pandemic. Um, and here was really a focus on the interface of science and policy. And so what I call phase zero, when um, the virus was first, um, uh, or some new disease was seen in Wuhan, and from there on, um, spreading around the world and countries, including Switzerland, going into lockdowns. Um, I call phase zero because we didn't have any coordinated scientific advice. As you may remember, a lot was going on on social media, etc. Scientists speaking up, warning, saying what um, will probably happen. Um, no coordinated um, scientific advice, also at the moment when Switzerland went into lockdown in mid-March 2020. Between then going into lockdown and 1st of April, there were a lot of discussions on um, between heads of the, in, of the academic institutions in Switzerland um, and the government, which led to the installation of a Swiss-wide science task force starting their work on the 1st of April 2020. And first, the mandate was as long as the extraordinary situation um, um, was um, uh, um, in existence, namely until mid-June. Then in the next phase, um, it was decided, well, while um, Switzerland went out from the lockdown, the crisis is obviously not over such that the government said they want continued advice. So there was a second mandate for the uh, scientific advice for another year until August 2021. And then um, in August, um, we were in the middle of um, the vaccination campaign, but also with Delta starting to spread, showing some immune escape. It was clear, again, the pandemic is not over. And the um, a third phase um, was started, a third mandate for scientific advice, which ended at the end of March when Switzerland went back into the normal situation. So we have no special um, measures, uh, more laws, etc., uh, from the f Federation regarding the pandemic, while of course the pandemic is still not over. But that means that um, the scientific advice also stopped and now we're in the fourth phase, so the normal situation in political terms, and there is no coordinated scientific advice to the government, and it's um, now back to the Federal Office of Public Health being in, in exchange on punctual topics with certain scientists. Now, what I want to focus on um, now is how did molecular epidemiology um, play into the different phases? And so first, molecular epidemiology, what do I understand or mean with that? I mean with that, aiming to understand epidemic spread of the virus, SARS-CoV-2, looking at molecular data, more specifically, generally, genomic sequencing data. And so here what I display you is a phylogenetic tree of SARS-CoV-2 in Switzerland. So the dots are represent patients of whom swaps were taken, tested positive, and then the genome was sequenced. And then based on how similar and how different the virus and the different patients is, we can reconstruct a tree, which is a proxy for the transmission pattern. So early on, you see um, very, um, the root of the tree on the very left. It started at some stage in December. That was still in Wuhan. Not um, The samples here shown is just Switzerland, but obviously um, from Wuhan, the virus spread around the world, and then it's introduced several times in different locations, and we can reconstruct back also history before the first um, Swiss patient was actually sampled. So 
in order to do molecular epidemiology, and I show you examples where it can help in a policy response, obviously we need the data, namely genomic sequencing. And so that in Switzerland, to also give, give you a review what happened, the first year of the pandemic, that relied exclusively the sequencing on individual scientists deciding to sequence SARS-CoV-2. And there are also sequencing efforts were partially funded through this NRP, so some groups did sequence um, as part of those research projects, other groups finding um, other sources of money, but pretty much the genomic surveillance, or I'm going to argue that um, we need surveillance also from genomic terms, was actually exclusively funded through research money. Then one year into the pandemic, um, March 20. One, actually the FOPH launched a sequencing program across Switzerland. It was very much um, um, kind of driven by the experience um, around Christmas 2020, when just a few days before Christmas, we all heard about the increasing number of reports from the UK that there's a new variant termed later alpha spreading and actually um, the government wanted to know how much it's circulating in Switzerland and many labs stayed over, open over Christmas, were retrospectively funded actually by the Federation, but it became clear it's not um, surveillance if you rely on research labs not having a contract for surveillance to just do at the moment important surveillance. So this program was funded for a year. Um, Every week, um, roughly 2,000 sequences uh, were generated in different labs all over Switzerland. And it also finished this program in the 31st of March 2022, so when also the task force stopped and Switzerland went back into a normal um, situation. And um, then um, the idea now is um, based on um, the FOPH side, that this program continues on a very reduced basis, so 25% of the initial funding. And we'll come back later on what that means, what can be done with surveillance. And so now what I want to discuss is in those different phases, which policy relevant information actually did or could genomes reveal. And let's look into this first phase, um, going um, all the way up to um, us all being in lockdown in March. So before there was a Swiss case, actually um, a lot of, um, uh, well, a lot of um, uh, sequences, genomes were, um, reconstru uh, were um, samples were sequenced and genomes were obtained. Um, that started already in January. And what actually worked quite um, well was at least, um, um, in, or in particular for patients traveling out of China and being sampled all around the world, that the genomes were generated very quickly and shared um, publicly with everyone. And so next strain, um, spearheaded by um, Richard Neer at the University of Basel here in Switzerland and Trevor Bedford from Seattle, um, those genomes were shown on um, trees in next strain. And the, the colleagues reconstructed kind of every day what um, is the most likely route of um, transmission out of Wuhan and in which parts of the world did the virus already arrive once several times. And in parallel, and that's where our group comes in, you can go also a step further and actually analyze um, the trees further beyond just looking at, and, at it and just asking where do the genomes come from and did they go from Wuhan to Germany and from Germany maybe we see a descendant in Italy. So um, asking which routes it took, we can also ask how fast is the virus spreading? So what is the basic reproductive number of the virus, which was in January um, very much discussed how fast is it actually spreading meaning how much interventions would we need in order to um, contain spread of the virus. And so initially we had um, less than 100 genomes and um, the idea is based on those 100 genomes you, re you reconstruct such a tree and branching events are transmission events. And so then you ask when did transmission happen and how quick does it happen? 
And so as much as if you look at just incidence data and you ask how much does it accumulate through time, you ask how much, how fast does this tree grow through time? And you get an independent estimate of the basic reproductive number, which was at the time um, very interesting or uh, essential to have different estimates because it was not clear what the basic reproductive number is and the initial estimates were based on case data from China and it was not fully clear how, um, well, how good um, this data actually is and how consistent the testing is. And so um, Julien Rio and Christian Althaus used the incidence data in China and got an R0 estimate of around um, two, so very fast um, spread. And we used uh, genomes and actually then um, a few weeks later, so it was actually we reported publicly on the day of the first Swiss case, the 25th of February, and for different locations, China, Italy, um, Washington State, and the US, um, we obtained also estimates um, a bit higher than um, Christian Althaus and Julien Rioux, but in the same order of magnitude, some basic, the basic reproductive number being somewhere between two and three. In particular, it also showed that the spread of the virus was very similar across many different geographic locations. So there was no reason for, say, European countries anymore to think well, it's bad in China, but somehow our climate is different or our contact structure is different, it's different here. It clearly showed we expect pretty much um, what was happening early on in Wuhan. At the same time in this phase, it was clear, I mean, we just discussed end of February was the first Swiss case. Um, it was then pretty much clear with this fast spread, we'll have um, a lot of transmission in Switzerland and we should obtain an understanding of the genomic composition of what is circulating in Switzerland. So what we did in March 2020 is um, we teamed up with a um, diagnostic laboratory, a commercial diagnostic laboratory, Violiage. So they are one of the major players in Switzerland do, doing diagnostic tests. And they um, offered to send us all their RNA extracts, which they um, had pretty much left over from PCR testing so we could sequence them. And so um, we started then um, late March 2020 to um, sequence the viruses and up to kind of um, the end of this uh, uh, you know, first phase um, towards um, end of uh, lockdown, releasing measures, we had roughly 500 sequences um, collected all over Switzerland and so got a first rough picture of you know what is circulating here and um, there was nothing um, too unexpected to report in a sense well it was the Wuhan strain and every two weeks you could see in the data there's a mutation accumulating in a lineage. Um, those efforts I already um, mentioned then were ramped up later on and meanwhile um, we sequenced in this effort from Violier samples roughly 70,000 sequences so those initials say 100 we had was a lot of work in the first few weeks that over time was all being done very routinely um, and overall Switzerland has published um, uh, in the open domain 140,000 um, sequences. With the whole first phase now to conclude though on I said I want to highlight also aspects science policy there were a lot of molecular surveillance um, efforts and um, people shared openly the data. Um, everything was discussed on social media, but there was no official kind of exchange between um, science and policy. Um, there was no task force yet and there were no official other channels. And then once this uh, mandate of the Swiss Science Task Force started, um, so in April, um, one of the activities um, we did was very quickly um, writing a short um, um, report slash proposal that actually for surveillance you need genomes um, to and encourage that on a federation level this should be organized. In parallel, um, we continued doing studies on understanding the spread um, of the SARS-CoV-2 from Wuhan all over Europe um, and actually asking how um, useful or how efficient were um, the uh, closure of borders. 
And what we see from um, analysis of such um, big phylogenetic trees, so essentially what you see is um, the tips again, or the, the, the little um, um, balls are sequences, and they're colored according to the country they were collected. And then you can reconstruct how much do you have migration from one country to the other versus how much do you have local transmission. So if, for example, the top is all blue, it's all local transmission in France. And pretty much what you what was shown um, across uh, different countries is that once borders were closed, the actual main problem was actually the local transmission. So um, while obviously border closures helped to slow down the importation, Europe already had quite um, many um, local transmissions. And I should say this was a very much spearheaded all the work by Sarah Nadeau, who yesterday already gave um, a bit of insights into that. Um, here, it's important to note, though, and we'll get to this also later, that um, um, throughout the pandemic, um, policy responses for the initial variants and new variants were often started with closing borders. And the time, also um, additional and later analysis showed that often once borders were closed, the virus was anyways in the country and um, local transmission, um, uh, targeting local transmission would have been very um, efficient way forward to limit and mitigate slash contain the spread. Then um, going to the next phase, um, summer 2020, um, case numbers were very low all over Europe, including in Switzerland. Um, the second mandate of the science task force was started and for the science task force a big aspect was being prepared for um, uh, a most likely next wave since it was still um, a couple months anticipated until a vaccination program could start. And in that, that phase um, was then governed from the molecular epidemiology phase very much on, um, from evolutionary perspectives, you would expect the virus changes and at some stage there is, or there is selection in certain directions and so the phenotype of the virus is expected to change at some points. And what concerns us, say, as a population is if we get, uh, if we see a new variant of concern, which is defined by WHO as a variant which either has a higher transmissibility, so it just spreads way faster in the population, so it's harder to contain, um, if it causes more severe disease outcome, so more people are going to hospital or die, or if it escapes uh, the immune response from a previous infection or later once we vaccinated from vaccination. And one of the major goals of this um, large-scale sequencing was to quickly find potential variants of concerns, um, analyze them, and if there's really a, say, concern, to inform quickly the policymakers such that early on policy um, um, actions can be implemented. And here, actually, over summer 2020, um, there was a variant, I colored in orange, which all of a sudden um, we saw increases. And I should say here, this is really um, was driven by Emma Hotcroft. Um, we closely collaborated with her. She's very active on Next Strain. She looked at the Next Strain tree essentially and saw there's a certain variant, call it, it just increases in Switzerland. And we were wondering, is this now more transmissible than the previous Wuhan strain? And if that would be the case, obviously many things um, um, change. Previous measures containing the virus would not be efficient enough anymore to contain the virus because the virus is just more transmissible. And what um, we then did, looked over different um, countries, and actually first we looked by accident first at Spain and we're like, whoa, this is just all over this orange strain, later um, called 28.eu1, um, whatever, there are many um, <laughs> um, special names of those strains, so I call it now orange, UK also was dominated by it, but interestingly enough in other countries it was not so clear, Norway even, um, it pretty much, um, it was at some stage dominant, then they had low case numbers and then it did not um, um, spread again. And actually then Emma going very carefully into um, where did it first um, appear, namely it was in Spain, and then doing, uh, um, inquiring some contact tracing data, what, what we could show was that actually most plausible is the hypothesis that in Spain, somewhere um, among agricultural workers, this variant first evolved 
and then it entered um, the, um, the travel tourism um, population and actually a lot of tourists coming back from Spain brought home this virus and then they are I guess the more mobile population if you travel through during the pandemic and normally also in Spain it's a large young population traveling there they also went um, out and in bars etc in their home countries so the virus actually this orange strain could s spread very fast um, just because it was in a population which had a lot of contacts that was then our, say, running hypothesis. It made sense also with respect to which countries have a lot of travel um, connection with um, Spain, and the UK, Switzerland, um, also the Netherlands. What finally convinced us really there is no advantage is once um, the second wave really started hitting in, um, in um, mid or end of September, early October. So based on the genomes, we can um, estimate the reproductive number of the orange strains and the non-orange strains. Or here, the color here is now a bit odd, but red is orange. Um, and so pretty much what you see, middle September, both strains had a reproductive number of lower than one, and actually, through the genomes, we see importations from abroad. So we saw an increase in this orange strain, but in the phylogenetic tree, you see that there are a lot of new orange subtrees in Switzerland, which all came, say, from Spain. So you just had an increase in orange prevalence, say, because there were importations, but locally, mid-September, there was still not um, an exponential spread of the orange strain in Switzerland, and once, um, supposedly due to seasonal factors, virus circulation increased, the reproductive number increased both for the orange strain and all other strains, so really it was a demographic effect and not a viral um, cause. But then actually, and we quickly talked about that already before, then in mid-December from the UK, we got reports about yet another variant, which we um, later called um, Alpha, first detected in Switzerland, actually on Christmas in Isabella Eckerle's lab. Um, and then um, people uh, over Christmas, New Year, in different labs in Switzerland sequenced a lot. And so through modeling, one could already see um, late September that despite currently decreasing case numbers, um, one would expect in March dominance of alpha and then an increase in um, case numbers given nothing changes. And so in that time, actually, the science policy um, interaction worked quite well in the sense that there were close discussions with government members. Um, from the political side, what was done, we commented on that before, actually, the first thing was a ban on flights from the UK. And then only local transmission was kind of targeted in mid-January when it was apparent that actually this alpha is indeed growing exponentially underneath the still dominant Wuhan strain. And then after that, as mentioned, um, in March, um, a national genomic sequencing program was launched. And then um, in that phase of this national genomic sequencing program, the third phase of the mandate um, of the science task force started. And that was then very much governed first by a delta wave. And then as we all could experience um, end of the year, a new vari variant Omicron arriving. So in November 2021, um, genomic data pointed towards um, Omicron governing transmission dynamics in Switzerland as early as um, the start of 2022. And then, um, while well, this was pretty clear it will take over and it will spread, it was not so clear quantitatively what it exactly means. But then with, increase, with um, analyzing the genetic sequencing data and determining what fraction of Omicron cases versus non-Omicron cases one had in each, you know, on each day essentially, one can then um, simply calculate scenarios what will happen if nothing changes, including not behavior of the population, and it was clear in Jan in January, if there's no other measures or contact um, changes in contact structures, there will be 20,000 or more um, cases and many more infections, obviously, due to hidden numbers. And actually, um, January 1st, we had 20,000 cases, and that went, as you all know, much um, up quite a lot. 
Again, there, my um, perception was there was a very close interaction with the government members. They knew what science, what the um, what uh, is known and uh, not known about the virus. Conclusions obviously can always be what then to do. Um, there might be different opinions and at the end politics decides, but there my understanding was they knew first we didn't know too much um, about severity of Omicron, um, but we knew it spreads very fast and that arrived there. But again, um, the first thing being done were flights to South Africa um, being cancelled rather than testing at borders, etc. And then um, only a month later was actually local transmission targeted with um, 2G certificates. This now brings me um, towards the end, um, the last phase, and this is now looking forward. So since 1st of April and going forward, um, where are we at? And so as was highlighted um, by Annelies very nicely yesterday, obviously we all don't, what we know is the virus is here to stay. But we do not know precisely which variant will arrive when. And I'm just arguing for, we just need to be prepared. So we need to monitor what's happening on very different angles. Here today I talk mainly on the molecular epidemiology, on the genomes that we know which variants come. And there are um, actually, um, I mean, many tools obviously in the inter uh, on the internet where you can track variants. Three of them are Swiss-based. One, um, which was discussed yesterday by Charan Chen and Sarah Nadeau from our group, um, Cov Spectrum, where all the global data available is being analyzed um, per country and you can um, check for each variant if they have a current growth advantage um, and uh, investigate then what or calculate scenarios when, you, uh, when it would be expected that variants take over. Here I show you um, BA4 as an example from Denmark though, not from Switzerland. Why from Denmark? Well, the sequencing program in Switzerland decreased by quite a bit. So we do not have enough sequences right now to detect those very minor variants. So in Denmark, it's also less than a percent. They sequence much more. So we don't know about BA4 and BA5 at this point in Switzerland. Then Emma Hotkoff, she's um, spearheading covariants, where you can then read up in detail about particular variants. And last but not least, on next strain spearheaded by Richard Nea, you see you can explore the big trees. In addition to the genomic composition of clinical data, um, wastewater data can and should play an important role. Here you just see the reproductive number estimated from wastewater in purple, cases in yellow, and it gives you the same pattern. So wastewater data is very powerful to, um, for variant, estimate the reproductive number. You always need a bit of clinical data that you actually know what, what to look for in the wastewater because they are only the fragments. But with a bit of clinical data and a good wastewater monitoring, one can actually um, get quite good surveillance um, on the variants, um, shown here for the six different locations, which were explained in a lot of detail yesterday by Christoph Ott. So going forward in Switzerland, regarding um, molecular epidemiology, there are close interactions of FOPH with the genomic sequencing program, with the wastewater surveillance. But since April 1, no official interactions between the actual government making decisions and science. So it all goes now again through the Federal Office of Public Health. And so generally, what um, what did we learn about the role of molecular epidemiology in infectious disease surveillance throughout the pandemic and for the future? Well, in Switzerland, data collection and sharing in the first year, the sharing worked well, the collection was up to individual scientists. Um, metadata is an important factor which does help us a lot if it's connected to sequences, say if we know how many people get hospitalized for a certain variant, we can then investigate severity of the disease. That's not working very well um, across the board uh, globally, including in Switzerland. Um, in Switzerland, policymakers during um, the last year, I would say they were updated regularly and timely, but now um, it's not clear what happens if we have again a new variant um, which we need to, which is policy relevant. Going forward, I think um, the pandemic showed us that beyond SARS-CoV-2, um, global sharing of genomic data is very um, helpful and policy relevant for infectious disease surveillance. The metadata um, is needed, and I argue that we need to establish such, such systems in a 
non-crisis mode such that we are prepared when the next variant or the next um, zoonosis happens and we can actually monitor well. With that, I want to thank all the involved um, um, players in this um, very collaborative project. Thank again for having the opportunity to talk and looking forward to your questions. So personally, I would have felt the best model is directly have a switch to some form of, it doesn't need to be the permanent next few decades committee where you discuss those things, but some in between. It was, though, nothing was then kind of really kept alive. What I'm personally now trying with colleagues in a task force, and obviously happy to you know, CH++ is another player not now connected to task force. I think, I hope we can use this window of opportunity where people say at FOPH and the government are still realizing that um, there were aspects they needed academia and incorporate that now. But unfortunately, I think it needs now to go for a couple months through individuals rather than an institutionalized process. But with the aim, I think we need to institutionalize it. Because I think tomorrow, if there are different people say, in Bersay's team, I'm not sure who to call. Like now, if tomorrow is a variant there, I feel, yeah, some people in task force still have the relevant phone numbers, but not going forward in a year, and it should not be up to individuals. But yes, I hope we can use the time now to have their ear still and their memory that it was helpful. But you're saying we're somewhat um, back to phase zero in a certain way. The way yeah. like yes, which I find is a bit disappointing. What I heard also from, um, well, I think what didn't help was we had a few also meetings planned to discuss the interface science politics beyond the pandemic, just generally it's important. Well, and then the next crisis hit very hard, the Ukraine, which I understand then some of the energy in burn is occupied with that. On the other hand, we see now, I heard from people there, there's also some frustration that actually science is not playing a role in that crisis, which is frustrating in a sense, nothing was learned. Maybe being more optimistic, we can help, you know, use this frustration for something more um, helpful, but I think it needs to be institutionalized in some form. And we should discuss, obviously, different players have different ideas, but it doesn't work if it's, oh, I call you if there's something, because yeah, you were very involved in early 2020, I guess. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent talk. Um, is it possible to give a prognosis if we will see a variant which is um, which has a severe outcome again? Right now, it's all dominated by a very transmissible but not so severe variant. Is mm. what's your prognosis on that? So there, from an evolutionary perspective, I should say there's no reason for how, uh, how SARS-CoV-2 displays disease that it evolves towards, towards something milder, because pretty much by the time you die, you already infect, like, you already infected enough people. So there's only evolutionary pressure if you pretty much die on the first encounter before you had the chance to infect people. But people who are dying of SARS-CoV-2 is, say, four weeks into the infection, so they had all their contacts. And if they now die or not, it's from an evolutionary perspective irrelevant. Meaning there, I don't expect evolution towards something milder per se. And so we saw Delta and Alpha, which was more severe than the Wuhan strain, Omicron less severe. The next one may as well be more severe. But on a population level, it, I expect it to be less and less severe just because pretty much all of us now have some sort of uh, antibody T-cell response. But the virus per se, um, encountering a completely naive person, I don't expect it to go in any particular direction. Very nice, Tanya, to see this overview <laughs> over the past two years that had really impact on all of our lives. So you, you mentioned things should be in institutionalized now, and uh, obviously scientists have ideas what should be done now uh, to keep at least a minimum of, of surveillance and, and also other things that should be done. But at the end of the day, this is 
probably not necessarily um, basic science that, for instance, the SNF could fund. Uh, who should pay if the government is reluctant to do anything? So, uh, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, these, these things cost money and, and you don't do it for free. Mm -hmm. You need personal and reagents. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. And I think we have a problem if the government slash FOPH is not willing to fund it because I think they are... FOPH has the... Um, well, needs to ensure the public health of this country and if surveillance is required... It's their job to um, um, ensure that it's being maintained. So I think indeed we have a problem if they don't realize the need for that. Then all I can think of is that probably um, the academic institutional players, including the SNF, etc., we need to be vocal on you know, what is research and what is actually surveillance. And I think researchers during the pandemic already did quite a lot, which is more on the surveillance side, which I also find is fine, say, if the pandemic starts, we were all, I mean, we can't have an office of public health to ensure in any moment that a full pandemic like this is being fully uh, dealt well with and they can cover all aspects, so they can involve academia. But the long term, I think we can support if we have certain tools, we aid, you know, um, expertise, we can do that, but it needs to be coming from the more administration side um, as requests. But I think potentially, yeah, the, the academic institutions could help to um, make that very transparent and clear that this is needed. Thank you very much for this beautiful presentation. I'm in the field of health communication, and yeah, I'm, I'm leading a project on institutional health communication. And you, pointed out a lot this important dialogue between science and policy. My question to you is what about uh, informing about this work uh, to the public? Because what comes out from our project is that there was a lot of unclarity was about the task force in general, mm -hmm. and especially on understanding a lot of measures which seems to be prompted into the community, but they mm -hmm. were not. There was mm -hmm. a lot of work. So my question mm -hmm. is, how do you deal and what can we learn from this for the future? Thank you. Thanks. So indeed, I didn't cover for time reasons all the aspect on the pop communication to the population, which was also for the task force um, challenge. Um, and in a way, what I think definitely, um, I mean, there were sometimes requests by some politicians, scientists should not talk anymore. I think that's even on a legal um, basis, not even possible. Science, we have freedom of science, and this is in the Verfassung, um, in the Constitution, so there's no way um, on that. But I think um, a more subtle point and how to reach the population and not generate confusion is that um, it should be clear to the public what can science offer and what can science not offer. And sometimes I think that was not clear, and we also, as scientists, were just, I mean, the pandemic hit, we tr I would say all of us tried our best to explain but sometimes maybe we were so, so I can talk now about my field, you know, you know so well there are uncertainties and whatnot. Maybe sometimes the subtlety that it's not certain gets dropped between the scientific lab and the population. So this is one thing I think for all of us where we can, you know, all uh, are on a path to um, see where we can improve. And the other part is what the population expects from us in a sense, on what do we talk and what do we not talk. And sometimes I felt they want to know from us what now the government has to do. But that's actually our job is doing the science and outlining, you know, say before the second wave, you can open, leave restaurants open, it was clear to everybody, a lot of people will die before they have access to a vaccine. Or you close restaurants, but who are we? We are not elected or legitimate um, kind of mandated to decide anything. So we can lay out options which the government has to decide, but I think for, the, for some parts of the public, they thought we are now deciding, which made also the life for the politicians hard because they thought we are this other power to do things, but we do the science. And I think there comes in again, if it's more institutionalized than for the next crisis, I mean, we might have an energy crisis, say, the scientists then involved that there is clarity both for the population and the scientists, what are actually our jobs, our roles, and so then a lot of confusion could potentially um, go away. But I think at the end there's still, yeah, a lot to do, even if we do all those things well, on reaching the public, and I guess that's then your expertise. 